concepts and their knowledge are just not enough. So the uh, um, German philosopher Kant famously talked about human uh, knowledge, about the human facu- epistemic faculties as made up of concepts and intuitions, where intuitions are perceptions or empirical data. And he told us that concepts without intuitions are empty and intuitions without concepts are blind. So we need concepts to guide us in our attempts to navigate the world. But we also need intuitions to fill the concepts up with content. So without uh, the real life, real world experiences, concepts remain empty and abstract. And I think that if we think about uh, words, concepts like quality, dignity, autonomy, they remain exactly that. They remain black marks on white paper unless we choose to infuse them with content and we do that not only by using the thoughtfulness and analytic capacities we have but also by using our hearts and intuitions and common sense. When we think about quality and what that might mean to patients I'm unlikely to experience a low-grade insult when I walk into my local spa Um, And it's much more likely to happen in big places, places, big institutions, where um, pressures and processes are governed by uh, uh, things that are bigger than than the individual. But in fact, if we think about the causes of these low-grade insults, they often take place because of an individual's decision to look away, to ignore, to not return somebody's (laughs) smile, I think in my experience as a patient, it was actually these low-grade insults that made the most difference to me, that caught me in the most um, inappropriate times and that left a very um, sour taste in my my mouth after experiencing them. So, So we've got these two parts of the equation. We've got the one thought that concepts on their own can't do all the work and glossy brochures and, uh, and directives are part of the solution, but not the, the full solution. So the things that happen at the, at the lowest level, at the sort of most common interface, that is the kind of thing that patients experience and remember uh, very, very uh, distinctly, very powerfully. So what, what can we do about it? I think one thing that I've spoken here about before um, is something I call epistemic justice. And what is wrong isn't just that people who speak aren't taken seriously or people who speak and complain aren't being heard, but that the words that people say in specific contexts, in specific situations, don't carry the epistemic weight, don't have the testimonial force, if you like, that they ought to have. And one obvious solution to this problem is to think about what a situation of equal uh, um, uh, or or peer-based dialogue might look like. So hierarchies exist. Again, I don't think healthcare or the NHS are unique in that respect. But they can also be overcome. And it always depends on the interlocutor's position in the conversation and the ways in which they choose to listen or not to listen. And I thought I would, um, I would use one example that happened to me only yesterday to illustrate this point. What do I mean by this uh, uh, notion of epistemic injustice? So um, I use oxygen to get about, and I have to order that on the telephone, and I phone a call centre. And I have to remember to order it three days before I need the delivery, which is a tricky thing in itself. On Wednesday, I forgot to call, so I called up first thing on Thursday morning and said, I'm really sorry I forgot to call yesterday. Can I have the delivery for Friday? And the person in the call centre said, you know, computer says no. You'll only get it on Tuesday. And I said, oh, really? What am I supposed to do until Tuesday then? She didn't have a clue. And I said, well... Do you know, I have to do this every week, and out of every 52 weeks I do it, in one of them I'll be bound to forget to call at the right time. But she didn't respond to that. Now, I wasn't particularly offended because um, 
I knew how to get around that, how to arrange for the oxygen delivery to take place. But it very easily could have not been the case. And I think the bottom line is that when you receive health care, you are to an extent more vulnerable to the sense that we all share anyway, which is that we're all in the hands of other people. The profound sense of vulnerability and dependence is exacerbated to very, very extreme extent. So now I've kind of set you up to have no faith in moral philosophy, <laughs> but I'll still offer one, one thought from, from Kant, who, um, whose moral formulation was very simple. He said, we should always treat other people as an end, never as a means. So when we think about the situation of healthcare, we can still bear in mind that there is a kernel of truth in what Kant said, that people shouldn't be thought of as beds or um, spaces in, in someone's um, schedule or a, any kind of backlog or whatever other metaphors you folks use. Um, people are always an end. They're always something that is to be appreciated for its own sake. And I think our society in many ways has kind of forgotten that. But if there is just one thing I can leave you with, it is this thought that um, one way to think about quality is to take this Kantian maxim to always treat people and think of them as an end and never as a means. The kindness of strangers is, um, I think, something that can come very cheaply and very intuitively to, to all of us. And, and I call on everyone to um, just make it their own, their own maxim as well. Thank you.